Picture someone in a wheelchair who has an injury to their spinal cord. If I had told you I could make that person walk again, do you think their life would return to normal? The answer is not necessarily. This is because injury to the spinal cord causes many more problems than not being able to walk. I'm Dana McTagg, and this is my life's work. I'm a scientist in the Department of Neuroscience at The Ohio State University. I became passionate about spinal cord injury as a trainee when I learned that there are no approved treatments for spinal cord injury that can improve recovery. Further, if you think about it, this devastating condition can happen to any of us or our loved ones in an instant due to a car crash, a sports accident, or even a simple fall. As I mentioned, spinal cord injury causes many problems beyond the inability to walk or move. For instance, individuals often lose their ability to voluntarily control their bladder and their bowels. They can develop severe pain that does not respond to pain medicine. They can lose normal sexual function, which reduces quality of life and can be devastating for couples who want to have children. And on top of all of that, Spinal cord injury often causes progressive disease throughout the body, which manifests as metabolic syndrome. You may have heard of metabolic syndrome in the context of obesity. However, this condition commonly develops after spinal cord injury, even in lean, otherwise healthy individuals. Indeed, clinical studies with human subjects and data from our laboratory show that spinal cord injury leads to excess adipose or fat accumulation, elevation of blood lipids like cholesterol and LDL, which can clog arteries, and excessively high blood glucose. These individuals also develop a condition called fatty liver disease. Compared to the general population, this collection of metabolic problems increases the risk for diabetes by six times and the risk for heart disease by more than eight times in spinal cord injured individuals. My laboratory is dedicated to addressing this problem. And while fixing metabolic problems may not seem as exciting as making someone walk again, it turns out it is actually a high priority for many people after spinal cord injury. In fact, surveys of the spinal cord injury community consistently show that regaining the ability to walk is fairly low on their priority list. As explained to me by a person with a spinal cord injury, he can get around pretty well in his wheelchair. He said he'd rather have scientists focus on all the other problems that impair his health and will decrease his lifespan. Indeed, these metabolic problems significantly increase mortality after spinal cord injury. This point was really brought home to me by one of my colleagues. Not only is she a scientist, several years ago, she sustained a spinal cord injury and became tetraplegic, which means she lost function in her arms and legs. She stated to me recently, that if we do not get these metabolic problems under control, she likely won't be here 10 years from now to continue her research, and she is younger than I am. While the evidence is clear that spinal cord injury triggers metabolic problems, diabetes, and heart disease, most of the research over the past 30 years has focused on making people walk again. This, of course, would be a welcome change for them, but it won't necessarily solve all of their problems. The reason is because the spinal cord pathways that control walking, pathways shown here in green in the image, are not the same as the ones that control organ function, which are shown in purple. What many people may not realize is that in addition to connecting to our muscles, we have nerves from the spinal cord that connect to all of our organs. These organ-specific spinal cord pathways are controlled by different brain regions than those controlling our muscles. So regrowing connections that control muscles and initiate walking will not necessarily cure metabolic disease and organ dysfunction after spinal cord injury. Addressing this problem is a major theme of my laboratory. We want to understand how injury to the spinal cord so massively disrupts our body metabolism. And then we want to use this information to develop therapies to prevent metabolic problems and disease in the spinal cord injury population. Metabolic syndrome involves many different organs and systems. However, we believe that the liver plays a key role in metabolic problems after spinal cord injury. Thanks to funding from both the NIH and from generous philanthropy, we are now beginning to understand why. Our prior research showed that the liver becomes inflamed just days after a spinal cord injury. 
new work in the lab is showing that this liver inflammation can actually play an important role in recovery from spinal cord injury. For instance, if the liver is inflamed when a spinal cord injury occurs, outcomes are significantly worse. This includes higher levels of blood glucose and lipids, worse fatty liver disease, and even larger lesions in the spinal cord itself. In contrast, if we prevent liver inflammation, these outcomes are significantly improved. Honestly, these results shocked me. In these studies, we did nothing to directly treat the spinal cord injury itself. All we did was alter liver inflammation, and by just doing that, we changed the outcome from spinal cord injury. You may be wondering, how can the liver play such a key role in these outcomes? Well, we are also wondering about that, and we've got some early clues. One is that the spinal cord plays a surprisingly important role in the function of our gastrointestinal tract, including keeping our gut microbiome in a healthy state. You perhaps have heard of the importance of maintaining a healthy microbiome, and you may even try to control your own with things like probiotics or kombucha tea. But our microbiome is not completely under our control. The spinal cord has a strong influence over it. Work by my OSU colleague, Dr. Philip Popovich, showed that regulation of the microbiome is lost after spinal cord injury. This leads to something called gut dysbiosis, which is when the bad bugs in our gut outnumber the good bugs. Not only that, the gut becomes leaky, which allows the bugs to leave the GI tract. And when they exit the GI tract, their first stop is the liver. This influx of bacteria causes massive liver inflammation, which, as I mentioned earlier, can lead to overall worse recovery from spinal cord injury. There's a second mechanism that we think contributes to metabolic problems after spinal cord injury. As I mentioned earlier, nerves connect our spinal cord and our organs, and these nerves send signals back and forth. In this way, the spinal cord is constantly informed of organ function, and it can respond to any changes through those nerves it sends to the organs. Interestingly, it can do all of this in the absence of the brain. So why do we need the brain then? Well, spinal cord output needs to be fine-tuned by the brain. If left to itself, spinal cord reflexes to the organs become amplified. They ramp up and basically overexcite the tissue, which can cause tissue inflammation and pathology. As you might imagine, injury to the spinal cord can disrupt those brain connections. This results in spinal cord reflexes having a free-for-all and leads to massive organ dysregulation. My laboratory is currently testing ways to basically tone down the spinal cord signals to the organs after spinal cord injury. Our goal is decreasing metabolic problems and lowering the significantly elevated risk for diabetes and heart disease. What is interesting about this work, however, is that it may have implications beyond just spinal cord injury. In fact, metabolic problems and gut dysbiosis occur in many other neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury, and even normal aging. Any brain pathology, depending on where it occurs, can negatively affect spinal cord signaling and result in organ pathology. So we are pretty excited because determining what goes wrong after spinal cord injury may not only help this population, but may also inform how to improve the health of individuals with neurological diseases or even in normal aging, which obviously affects all of us. Thus, my aspiration and my hope is that our work continues to unlock the mysteries of how pathology in the brain and spinal cord lead to diseases in the body. And I invite you to join us in this vision and follow along as we work toward making a healthier future for all of us. Thank you.